Uh, that's good. Um, I'm the state survey coordinator for the CAPS program, and uh, we've been tracking this since uh, 2003. It was one of my first trips uh, that I was authorized, uh, even though we had a travel in 2003 when I came on board with Ag and Markets uh, to travel out of state. But uh, this was my first trip. I did go to Michigan and spent five days working with Emerald Ash Borer. This has become a problem with all their invasive species in general, but especially insects and diseases because of our global travel and our Asian markets that have been opened up. We have such a vast amount of cargo coming in now on a daily basis that uh, the federal port authorities just can't uh, control or, or see, see this uh, or inspect enough cargo. So it's a lot of this dunnage that's coming in on this material that is vectoring a variety of uh, boring insects uh, and uh, diseases that come along with these problems. What we're going to look at today is the emerald ash borer. It's a very bright green, obviously emerald color. This is obviously up close and personal, much closer than you probably would ever want to see emerald ash borer. But it's a very small insect. Here it is in, in a scale for on a beetle on a, on a penny. Um, it gives you more, more perspective of how small this, this beetle actually is. It was confirmed in Michigan in 2002. Uh, and then very quickly after that, uh, Ontario uh, in Windsor, uh, Ontario, and uh, also in Ohio. But it was speculated because of the damage and the death of ash trees that has been you know, introduced five years earlier on dunnage material in Livonia, a suburb of Detroit. Uh, the Crop Agricultural Pest Survey Program is a nationwide program that uh, uh, has been around for about 25 years now, but has been uh, asked to step up to the plate and to do a much larger role in early detection and rapid response since 9-11 uh, using federal, federal uh, USDA APHIS PPQ dollars. And that's what we've been trying to do this uh, since 2002, 2003 here in New York is to step up to the plate on a variety of targets and Emerald Ash Borer is really one of those. So again, our, our, our challenge now is to, to slow the spread, have early detection, do some rapid response as much as possible on locating where emerald ash borer is at. And just real quick, the uh, Crop Agricultural Cultural Pest Survey, um, if you have not heard about this program, it's nothing new. It's been around, like I said, for 25 years. It is a, a joint federal and state cooperative program. Uh, our main goal is for early detection of invasive species, primarily insects and diseases, uh, that can be prevented by er rapid eradication uh, of the pest when we find it. Uh, we do this by, st uh, by quarantining uh, the, the pest, um, and doing uh, emergency action notices from a federal perspective and eradicating those pest problems as soon as we can if it's feasibly you know, possible. Stakeholders and public outreach, that's what you folks are in the PRISM organizations and other state agencies to help assist us in this process uh, are very, very incremental and, and very in, uh, important for this process to, to take place. Our last big thing, for because we are agricultural and ag and markets, uh, is for export enhancement. It's important that we, during our survey, as long as we can continue finding negative uh, uh, evidence that, that something is not found, insect or diseases, then we can basically uh, export our agricultural commodities uh, through bona fide research uh, and, and documentation of negative survey. So let's get into emerald ash borer. Like I said earlier, it was discovered in, uh, first in Livonia, Michigan, then Toledo, Ohio, and then Windsor, Ontario, all in 2002. Uh, since that time, it's been reported in Pennsylvania, Maryland, West Virginia, and much, much closer in Ontario, in Toronto, just 50 miles from um, Niagara Falls. And so as a result, it's very, very close to us. In Pennsylvania, it was in Butler County, Allegheny County, just uh, 90 miles south of uh, Cattaraugus and Chautauqua County. So uh, it's very close. It moves very easily on firewood. Again, it attacks all kinds of um, It kills even not only the, the weak and diseased ones, but also the healthy ash trees. And they take all varieties and all the species, uh, um, the black as well as the green. So we, it takes them all out. Uh, we did extensive surveys since 2003, initially just with tracking down any uh, ash trees that were stressed. Uh, two years we did uh, actually do some uh, Sentinel trap trees. Last year in 2007, uh, 389 times we, we worked with arborists, we worked with landscape uh, uh, inspectors or landscape uh, professionals, uh, any city forester who had an ash problem in their you know, parks or their city street, we were there to help strip the bark off that tree and make sure it was not emerald ash borer. 
Um, and so we can honestly say that we did not have any confirmation of emerald ash borer in the 2007 survey. Real quick, if you've not seen the signs of emerald ash borer, the very first thing you see is this one right here, the icon at 12 o'clock. The top of the tree uh, of an ash tree starts dying back. That's the very first sign you're going to see. There'll be no frask like you would do in a, a East Longhorn beetle. There'll be no early signs of, of bore activity. Just the top of the tree will flare up and die out because that's where the, tree, you know, the emerald ash borer attacks the tree is at the top canopy. Uh, what kills it is the larva at 2 o'clock here. Um, it's the larva feed on the cambium layer. Uh, they do not borrow into the heartwood at all. That's why it's so easily to be moved on firewood because people don't even realize it's infested with emerald ash borer. And the first sign you might see besides the dying of the, of the, of the canopy is the, uh, um, this, the bark, bark splitting here at 3 o'clock. Uh, again, this will be up in the upper canopy, so unless you have a set of binoculars, you're not going to see that. But what is seen are, are woodpeckers. Woodpeckers uh, hear the, the emerald ash borer larva feeding on the cambium. They will uh, start pecking and start uh, going after these larvae uh, as just as a food source. And so our, uh, if you don't see the top of the tree dying, you'll, you know, just look for the woodpecker damage on top of the ash tree. That's also an early sign of the first or second year of an infestation of emerald ash borer. Once you cut the wood open, split the bark back, you'll find the leaves of the larva feeding um, uh, eight months out of the year. Uh, when it does go to pupate, like you see down here at 5 o'clock, uh, this pupa stage is borrows into the, uh, into the wood. So when you're stripping the bark off, you might miss the pupa stage. It only uh, emerges out then as, you know, as the adults emerge here at, at uh, 6 o'clock or 7, and emerging and is out here at 8 o'clock. Um, this will be take place in the month of May, June, or even July. But usually May, June are the two big months they emerge. They are short-lived, July and August. By the end of August, early September, they've, they've all been dead. So again, what you're looking at is a very, very small D-shaped exit hole, as you see here at 9 o'clock, and, and on someone's fingertip there. It's very small, very, very easily you know, overlooked and very easily uh, neglected. By the time the, at, at 9 o'clock, and then at, at 10 o'clock here, you're looking at uh, epicormic branching on the tree. And this is the, the second and third um, year after the uh, emerald ash borer has attacked the top of the tree that you see all the, the last hurrah of the ash tree trying to grow from the rootstock and, uh, and basically the tree, the tree above is dead. So I was actually you know, in 2003 saw emerald ash borer attacking even the sucker growth at the base of the tree if they're you know, that desperate for a, another source of food. So those are your quick signs for emerald ash borer, but the woodpecker is one of the good key signs for early, early on looking for the woodpecker damage. Again, by the time you see this d shaped exit hole on the trunk of the tree, the trees are basically goners because the top, top canopy has been compromised and lost. By the time they move down the tree, the second and third year, you know, that tree is, uh, uh, is toast. Yeah, it's, 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 it's over with. Again, it's a D-shaped exit hole because it's, it's an, uh, one of the girlless fam uh, uh, family members, three to four millimeters in diameter. Uh, there's a lot of other D-shaped exit holes, but they're usually much larger. Um, because the beetle's larger to come out. Again, there's no signs of frass, no signs of early detection other than the tree dying back or the bark splitting. By the time you see the epicormic branching, the tree is pretty much on its last leg or pretty much it's gone. Emerald ash borer was a real problem in Maryland. If you might not have heard through the uh, grapevine, 117 trees were moved out of Michigan illegally uh, with a quarantine on a nursery. Um, those seven, 117 trees were moved to Virginia and Maryland and infested uh, because of the landscape operations that were done. Uh, and those, all those trees were tracked down, removed, destroyed at the, at the cost and expense of the uh, uh, landscape nurserymen from Michigan. Uh, but we, what we had is Virginia was very successful in getting it you know, corrected and, and cleaned up. In Maryland, it wasn't, wasn't quite so lucky. Uh, Emerald Ash Borer did get released to, to several swamp land areas, and um, they've had a massive effort to try to, you know, lock this up uh, in the one or two counties, Adams County down in Maryland. And uh, so it, it was a multiple, multiple state effort last year, January, February, and March of 2007, to not only locate all these ash trees, but actually cut them down and, and uh, chip them all up uh, before they emerged in the month of May. You can see in this picture up there at the top left corner, Emerald Ash Borer even feeds on the root flare. You know, they're so, so tenacious. And when you pull the bark back, what is you, uh, quite 
unique to the uh, emerald ash borer is that it has a serpentine gallery. It goes back and forth, starts out real small when the larva uh, just gets started in its first instar. As it gets bigger and bigger, then uh, the, the serpentine action you know, will just, and you can see to the far right there, the lower right, you know, it gets so bad that, you know, there's no cambium left for the tree to even to exist on. So uh, it doesn't, it isn't always with the big trees. You can see the little sapling in the middle. Uh, they'll go after even small saplings trying to get established. So emerald ash borer is tenacious. Here is a, a, a quick map of a risk assessment map that part of the things I have to do with as a state survey coordinator is to always point out to the, uh, um, the federal uh, contacts as well as our state uh, uh, authorities, what is at risk uh, when it comes to these pests that might be introduced? So it all, it's usually based on climate, it's also based on host material, and so this basically is a, uh, a map that helps you know, look at both of those situ situations and uh, warn uh, the different states that where well, emerald ash borer might indeed get established and do some serious damage uh, based on this color code. So very quickly, just give you a real rundown, a historical look at where emerald ash borer emerged in 2002. This is all done from a NAPIS map, which uh, is a national agricultural pest information uh, system that I uh, am mandated to, to respond to within 48 hours if it's positive and two weeks if it's negative. And it gives you a quick you know, five-year commitment. And this is our final picture that we, or our, I should say our map of what, where we're at right now with emerald ash borer in um, Central and, and the Northeast here. I get my here. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's right here. Let's see it. It's not showing. Up in Ontario, you can see there's a couple red dots that didn't didn't, didn't show. How we go back? I can't get my my cursor to. Is that over there? There it is. There it is. Okay. Ah. Oh, okay. Uh, on, in Ontario here. You can, right on, a, on a, a tip of an island here and up here in Ontario, Ontario that's the two closest spots we have now to, to New York. Uh, it was confirmed last November. And then you can see Butler County and Allegheny County in, in Pennsylvania, 90 miles just from uh, Chautauqua and Cattaraugus County. So this moves very easily on firewood, moves very easily on, uh, uh, on landscape materials because it goes undetected the first year. Um, and as a result, it can become a real problem. So, uh, that's why you've heard a lot of scuttlebutt about uh, banning firewood or trying to mitigate firewood moving from out of state from these various states, as you can see, lit up here already. So the survey co is, is, a, is a major effort here in the Northeast and uh, Central uh, United States. What we've been doing up until now is just been um, doing visual surveys and, and wounding trees, sentinel trap trees. N new from research is uh, a new lure called Manuka oil, and Manuka oil is not new, it's been around for aromatherapy for a long, long time. But through research, they found that was one device that brought emerald ash borer to the trap. And they've come up with this purplish uh, uh, trap that is uh, called a prism trap, ironically enough. <laughs> you know, it's a three-sided uh, trap that we hang up in trees. And in New York, we will have 2,000 of these um, in the, uh, north, uh, the western part, uh, and uh, because of the mandate from, from Canada as well as from Pennsylvania and Ohio, we're going to be not hanging them in the branch um, with the hangers. Uh, that took additional $100 investment for extension pole. It goes up to 30 feet. We're just going to use a throw line, as you see pictured here, using a, a, a weight on the end of it. As Jason Dunham already pointed out, a, a, a water bottle works just fine, tied uh -huh. to, you know, tightly to the... Uh, so if you don't have your handy throw bag or you lose it in the process, you can always use your bottle of water to throw it over a branch and, and boost it up. The reason that we need the purple trap up in the tree is because, again, the emerald ash borer is going to hit the top of the tree first before it hits the bottom. So we need to put that purple trap with the lure up in the canopy of the tree as high as we can get it. There is a yellow green that they're going to come up with next year. They couldn't, uh, the manufacturer of the chloroplastic plastic uh, that the trap is made out of couldn't Find, uh, couldn't you know, get that yellow green close enough, so I have that next year. So this just gives you a, a perspective map of where, thanks to DEC's uh, uh, Scott uh, designing this for us, where our 50 mile, 100 you know, and 100 mile radius will be, and we're going to be putting in uh, traps with the USDA APHIS PPQ in charge of that. 
DEC foresters helping assisting, Ag and Markets helping uh, to assist this project. Over 2,000 traps will be placed in that red and burgundy zone you see on this, on this map right now. Um, again, the 50 mile radius will have a tighter grid, one mile square, uh, and hopefully we'll find ash in those one mile squares. If, we're, if there isn't, we'll find it in a um, hang an intep of tree to fit that, that, that grid. And uh, 75 miles and 100 miles out, we will have uh, a one and a half mile grids that we'll place the traps in. There are actually four different tribal nations that are impacted in this, in this uh, uh, highlighted area, and we'll be working with those folks to get at least 300 traps on tribal nations. We won't necessarily try to put the traps up and service the traps. We're going to be asking the tribal nations or the uh, tribal councils to assist us in this process uh, if they so desire to. Um, so again, 2,000 traps there. Uh, part of my CAPS program, uh, we're looking at campgrounds uh, with the help of the uh, State Parks Association and the uh, uh, DEC uh, uh, parklands and anywhere that, that uh, even private campers uh, that bring out-of-state uh, campers to New York, uh, either through a form of RV or through uh, tenting, we'll be having over 80 uh, traps in these campgrounds, uh, hopefully hanging off of ash trees if they're available. If they're not available, then some type of other host. Just very quickly, the pest problems we have, we have here, you know, just you know, list them for you. Um, and I hate to say, but some of these are are brand new. That since I came on board in 2003, mm -hmm. Sarx uh, noctilio, the European crane fly, the European um, um, wood wasp, is the the top of the list that was detected in 2004. You all know about Asian longhorn beetle. It's been around since 1996 uh, on Long Island, New Jersey, and Chicago. Saw uh, Chicago only defeated it, but uh, New Jersey's still working on it. Hemlock woolly adelgid, if you're downstate, you know how devastating hemlock woolly adelgid is. Uh, it's moving upstate. It's now in, in here in Albany, and it did move into uh, Erie and um, Monroe County, so we're trying to fight the, the battle there. So without going through each one of these, these are all that, you, you know, if you go to our website, uh, you can certainly access all these, but uh, you can see the list on the, that are not established in New York, and those are the kind of things we're, we're trapping and looking for and trying to detect, uh, and when we do find it, we eradicate it. Uh, the third one there, Rostonia, chrysanthemum white rust, those are all ones that when we find it, we eradicate it immediately. Uh, once it's confirmed, it's a disease problem uh, on our plant material, and uh, those are eradicated. So we're looking at emerald ash borer. It's not a matter of, you know, if it's going to show, but it's a matter of when it's going to show up. Uh, the next load of firewood, uh, you know, from last year could already, already brought it in here, uh, for all we know. But uh, our early detection is to find it and then clamp down as fast as we can to eradicate it, but once it gets out um, of any type of uh, quarantinable area, uh, it'll be up to uh, everyone to be involved with emerald ash borer trying to slow the spread. The good news is there is a biological um, uh, source on the horizon that does a very good job, um, both, uh, you know, and so we're hoping that the Michigan's research that will pan off on this one that we can not only release a, a, a native wasp that will go out and actually harvest these larvae right in the tree, like, like the woodpeckers are doing, um, but also uh, uh, these wasps will, will snatch the adult right out of, you know, in, in flight. So uh, we're looking at those kind of biological predators that we already have um, here in the north, you know, here in the central, uh, in, New, in Michigan anyway, making sure that we can maybe make it available to, to be multiplied here in New York to slow the spread. So. You know, there's good things on the horizons, but uh, the detection, like I said right now, is, is using the brand new trap, uh, the prism, purple prism trap, and also using the manuka oil to have an early detection of where they are in the state of New York, if it's even here yet.